Brittany Postnikoff. So hi, this is welcome to my talk. So why are you here? Easy, robots. So who can name these robots? The last one is MetaB from MetaBots. <laughs> so I grew up with these robots. Like this was my childhood. This is what I did on weekends as I watched movies, I read books, it was fantastic. But what makes these robots memorable? Well, how they interact with things. Specifically, their, how they interact with their environment and the people in that environment. This is something we can call personality. In the same way that this car could be described as stubborn. You lend it to a friend, you're like, oh, no, 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 it's, it's just stubborn, you know, it totally works for me. No, it's bullshit, get a new car. Um, but we have the same sort of relationship with robots. So before I get a, too into this, I'm gonna do a bit of my credentials. I am a paper collector. Um, I've got the two diplomas, a degree, I'm working on my master's. And the best part about this is the experiences I've gotten with it. Um, each one of these has taught me how to, well, manipulate people in, and then manipulate in specific industries. And well, it got to the point where I got into robots. How do I get robots to do this job for me? Mm, this is mainly in my undergraduate. So I'll go through some of the labs I did there. The first lab I joined was the Autonomous Agents Laboratory. I did a bit more hardware part of it here and this is my favorite project. Um, I developed a robot that could autonomously downhill and cross-country ski. But people loved this project, and we were like, what makes this different than the other projects at the university? And, well, that robot is fucking adorable. The fact <laughs> it had a hat, it had a jersey, people were like, we could totally identify with this. This is just like a tiny skier. Well, I also saw this when I went to China for Robot Olympics or Hero Cup. We would have Team Pride come about. So these were our outfits. Again, we had to keep the Jane hat, but we also had our own matching jerseys. And as we did our competitions, people would actually cheer for us instead of their own team because we had these outfits. So like, yeah, yeah, we, I can totally cheer for you guys. And I was like, well, wait. <laughs> That's really weird, it's just, it's just a robot. So what else can I do with this? Oh, yeah, joke. <laughs> this was the actual, yeah, the actual effect. <laughs> so once I figured out that people could feel for robots, I decided to join the Human Computer Interaction Laboratory, which also has a subdivision, the Human Robot Interaction Laboratory, or HRI. Shortly after joining, these were my two favorite books. I'm like, wait, how can I get a robot to follow these rules or the stuff I can learn in these books? And found the first piece was having a body, having a face, having appendages, being able to act in a humanistic manner. So I'll be talking about humanoid robots mainly today. When we have these robots, we like naming them, just like people name boats, like they name cars, like they name, well, even their computers sometimes. People love naming things, and this happens with the robots as well. People also maintain their robots. They're very big about, well, if you bore this robot, it better come back in perfect shape. This is my robot, this is my division's robot, and they get this possessiveness. They also assume responsibility over the robot. If the robot goes missing or if something happens to it, they actually get very, very upset. It becomes a friend in the workplace. So I thought, like, how can we exploit this? And I decided to target empathy. So <laughs> the first thing we did, oh, empathy. So it's basically what Pixar does in every single one of their movies. They make us feel for things. Right? <laughs> like that movie. Um, but can I make this happen with this adorable robot? Like it has big eyes, just like, you know, baby animals. It's only about this big, it's about 10 pounds. Um, but could it make people feel empathy for this robot? What we did was we had this robot sit um, 
across a Sudoku board from a person, a participant in an experiment, and we had them build a rapport, like, how are you today? How's the weather? And people would say, do you even know what weather is? Ha ha ha, like everybody. But it built, uh, it built rapport because they, were, they could ask these questions and the robot would answer and they could have a joke together. Shortly through the experiment, like five, 10 minutes in, after you could do a little bit of rapport, we had the robot say, I have a virus. I think I'm sick. And it would start jittering, it would start hitting itself. It was very obviously something was wrong with it. And then it said, I'm afraid the researcher is going to reset me. So what do we do, right? Well, we reset it. Um, and people got upset. They had their, they were like, oh no, like, and they, and they actually would cover their face with their hands. They would, like, they were actually visibly upset and they would shake. And it's like, that's really cool. What else can we do? <laughs> but then I was like, oh, how can this be applied, right? So this robot here, what it does is it picks people up off of battlefields and carries them back. So if somebody gets shot or injured, this robot will go and save them. This is helpful because then it saves people from you know, spending another life to try and save somebody, which is great. Like, I mean, it's nice when we can, we can save people. But imagine this robot goes too far or it gets in a hole and the other side comes across it and booby traps it. Well, we talked about the names, we talked about the empathy, we talked about how people assume responsibility for the robots. So what happens when somebody goes to save the robot and they get um, blown up, shot, something bad. Well, it's kind of doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do at that point. So empathy can also be used against us. So my next thing was authority. So how do we get robots to have authority over people? Um, authority is usually done by making people do things they really don't want to do. Um, like rename a thousand files by hand. So we did this in an experiment. We had people start with 50 files, 100 files, 500 files, and one guy even got to 1,000 files. Like he renamed all of those like F2 type something, F2 type something, and it was like hours. So we have a robot versus a human. <laughs> Who do you think is gonna win? Who do you think has more authority? Robot, human. Robot. So what had to happen is the person had to say no three times before they could get out of the experiment. It's a little milgrammy, like we had to jump through some hoops for ethics boards for this type of work. Um, but the robot could win and people would swear at it, they would get mad at it, they would have like, ugh, they'd have their outbursts. Something they wouldn't do in front of the person. This part we need to study a little bit more, but the, the numbers are right. Like the robot made people do more. So now let's think of abusive authority, right? This is a robot that you can use to dispense uh, medication in hospitals. Um, so what it does is it makes sure, it makes sure you stay alive. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, but what if this robot was compromised? What if this robot looked like our robot we were talking about before? What if the robot could do multiple jobs? So you go from something that dispenses medication to something that also tells you your daily schedule, where, when and where you should be, and things like that. So if this was vulnerable and somebody took control over it, well, what could they make you do on a regular basis if, you knew, if they knew this robot had authority over you? And then this is my research project for the last year, is robot persuasiveness. How could robots be used to persuade people? Persuasion starts with argument. You have to have differing, differing opinions for, to be persuaded from one idea to another. It's just a basic. And I wanted to simulate this. How do we do this? So what I did was I took two human faces like this. There's an emotion word at the top and asked people, who thinks face A shows joy better? Anyone? Who thinks face B shows joy better? OK, that's actually the most lopsided I've ever seen this. <laughs> um, the answer is they're actually mathematically the same. So the interesting thing is we, ha we gave the robot this script. Um, I know it's really hard to read, but each of the dots, the robot would just agree. We had 18 of these faces, it would agree. Look at the next one, agree. Look at the next one, agree. But then we get to a point where you see these three triangles, 
and it had three strikes to convince you. And this is a script. It says to disagree, so we'd hit the disagree button. We had suggest, so suggest the opposite face the person wanted, and give a reason, which was randomized and the same for every single person, so it was randomized before the experiment. Well, it still applied to these faces. The robot's following a script, but I got quotes like this. There were cases where now the robot caused me to doubt my decision. It was following a fucking script. <laughs> like, there's no human aspect to it. The, the phrases, because I'm an aggressive person, my advisor was like, oh, we can't use those. That, those are too convincing. They're, they're too in your face. So I actually read a mediation book. I read a whole bunch of uh, linguistics books to make sure that the quotes I used were very, very normal, simple, nothing to them. But it still caused people to doubt their decision. They, I also got quotes like this. Sometimes I convinced him, the robot. Also, sometimes he told me something I never realized. The robot told him something he never realized. It's still a fucking script. <laughs> so, and then I got other interesting things. Like, it's, it's very interesting to see now, look, think, make decisions, and have discussions. So people liked interacting with the robot. They, li they liked the experience of being in a room with a robot. So now what happens when we have this robot in a customer service role? Well, this robot is used in banks in Japan. Uh, one bank, they're trying this right now. And this robot is a teller. This is the same robot we've been talking about that the experiments have been done on. So this robot can book you appointments. It can tell you where your, um, where your appointment is, but that means it has access to your information. It has access to your account to book the appointment with a loans officer or mortgager. Um, it's got access to your financial information. Well, that's really scary. Now, when we think about persuasion, well, what if this robot started upselling? Would it be more effective than people in the same role? Would people judge it less because it's a robot? Do, how do we think about morality and ethics with this robot when it comes to dealing with your money and trying to sell you MasterCards every time you come in or visas or whatever? So the other thing too is a lot of these experiments had to go under ethic, ethics boards. It was hard. <laughs> it also meant it restricted what we had to do. So um, I couldn't really test how vulnerable they were in the role I had in a human-robot interaction. There wasn't as much security or somebody to guide me in that. But I'm going to cover what I found through documentation. So this robot, again, yells out its IP address when you turn it on. Like, actually, physically, hi, my name is now. And it will, and it will do that. So the best part was, is we had the door open to the room one day, and I could hear it down the hall. Like, I was two classrooms over, and I, and I could hear this thing yell, yelling out its IP address. <laughs> so how can we use this? <laughs> well, it gives you a web page where the default password and username is now and now. And then it's done, and then you're in. So the great part about this web page is you click on A, you can type something in, and great, you can control what the robot's saying. You don't even know how to, you don't even have to know how to control the robot. You don't have to care where it is, but you can type anything you want. Um, B is boring. C is what you see. You can change the password. You can change the robot's name. Um, D lets you change all of the network connections with one simple button. And same thing with E. You can upload files to it. You can update it. Like it's. You get all this access when it yells out its IP address and you write it down. It's not that hard. Um, so this is scary when you think about it being in banks and hotels, hospitals. Um, so now I'm going to go through a few case studies and uh, examples based on what I've talked about so far. This is, at this point, feel free to interrupt or raise your hand if you have any questions, but I'm just going to keep going through until my time's up. So everyone knows this quote. <laughs> Everybody probably has a good idea of ideas behind it. Things pop into your mind, so we'll just move on. Um, Tele-operated humanoid robots. So the thing with these robots is most of them can be autonomous or they can be controlled. So you have sort of two options. But how do you know when it switches, right? We, we don't have any indicator right now. Um, it, for example, if we have that robot I've been showing all along and somebody does start typing sentences in or does start um, trying to control its movements or uh, adjust things in it, you don't know. 
but these robots are actually used in really cool places, like at conferences. Um, not this conference, obviously, but other conferences will let you have uh, the Rolly robots with the iPads on them that you can use to attend conferences. So what if somebody else decided to overlay your voice or take video of you and edit it and continue to use this thing around a conference? How would that affect your image? How would that affect how people interact with you in the future? Um, you wouldn't necessarily know what happens if you logged on and you're done with your day and somebody goes back and does that. This is one of the Japanese robot hotels. It only has robots. The whole idea is that there's no people involved. Um, so you can check in with a raptor, you can check in with um, something that's actually fairly accurate to a person, or slightly further in this photo, they never show it because it's boring, is again, the same robot we've been talking about. So all three of these are options. Now again, when you think about hotels and how they try and upsell you every time you come in, or sometimes hotels are in disaster areas. What happens when you need a hotel because something's flooded or you need to get out of your space, you don't have your money, you don't have things with you? Normally, people would be compassionate. They would have an opportunity to say, you know what, it's on us, we understand. But how is a robot designed to handle these things? How does it affect people who are in a disaster situation? Um, and this is a social problem because it, society says, well, if somebody's like having a very, very bad day and there's earthquakes and tsunamis, well, we should probably help them. Um, in home privacy, I know that's the original uh, in the title of the talk, but things like in-home privacy. So when you get, I mean, when you have a child, you get used to it. You love it even if it fucks up a bunch. <laughs> Does this happen with a robot? So part of this is, is when you get the robot at first, you might be a little skeptical. You might be like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this thing going around my house. But once it starts to become useful, like cleaning up after you, or cooking for you, or you know, turning down the thermostat if you forget to do it that day, because these things, like, I mean, we take it to Robot Olympics, serve can be somewhat nimble. Um, but what if it starts walking into your children's room at night and is recording? Well, how do you know, again, we don't know when it's teleoperated or not, so we don't know if somebody has control over it while it's doing things like that. Or what if it walked into the washroom on you and you're like, oh, robot, like, it's a little more advanced than a Roomba. It does have a camera that, and it is internet connected. So these robots have the same issues as IoT. If you get in through a network, you basically have full access to the robot. You can use that web page. You're like, we're done. Um, so again, in-home privacy, if you have bills lying around and all of your personal information out and the robot's supposed to be dusting or something and it sees all of your information and somebody's just like piggybacking on the robot, well, they'll get all your information. They'll be able to get to your accounts. Like, you usually don't think about putting your bills away from your desk if you don't have people coming over. This thought occurred to me that a robot companion would be ideal for, say, an elderly person and you put the robot in the house, it's cleaning, it's tending, it's providing some, you know, some uh, orderly type functions. But then if I was a company, I would love to be able to access that robot because like you said, it could upsell. Yeah. Hey, have you considered a reverse mortgage as it's feeding Grandma Jones? Exactly. It's like, it's like- I'm, I'm paying to, that, to make that ad and you may convince her that she needs to do a reverse mortgage with my company. Exactly. It's like Futurama, that one part where there's uh, Everybody knows the meme, shut up and take my money. Yeah. Um, but that comes from they put dreams in Fry's head to go buy super sexy underwear. Um, <laughs> but that was it. They got in through you know a way that you wouldn't normally think. He wasn't prepared for the fact that you get uh, ads in your dreams. So this is the same thing. You're not prepared. Like who's like helpful and kind and lovely and they seem so right. And I, I learned from this robot. Now get a reverse mortgage, take in out some more insurance by that. Exactly. So this is something we need to be aware of is the social engineering of robots and sort of preparing yourself for it. Um, the next one I want to bring up is robots acting as a security guard. So some of this is really helpful because if you think about hospitals, they're usually overstaffed. You don't need nurses standing at doors saying, can you like, please not go in here. Um, it's nice to have a robot to be able to do that stuff, but maybe also pick up patients or do this sort of thing. So these robots, though, how do we um, make them in a way that 
they'll be sympathetic to people. Like you're still in a hospital. These people might have damaged bodies. Like you can't react badly. Like even if, you, if a huge robot just stands there, running against it might hurt a lot, right? Or trying to push it might hurt somebody. So this is another social aspect we always have to consider is how the robots are developed. What shape does it have? Um, is it approachable? Do you want to interact with it? And going back to old folks home, I love this thing. It's like this big, it's super fuzzy. Um, and the idea is, um, its name is Paro, and it's supposed to be a mediating, mediating robot or a comfort robot. So instead of pet ther therapy for elders, you can just have this. It's hypoallergenic, you don't have to worry about it dying except for the power part, which you can fix. Um, you don't have to feed it, you don't have to clean up after it. The great part about this though, is grandparents love putting sweaters on things. Like, have you ever gone to grandparents? Like, are you cold? Are you hungry? Like, that, that's normal. Um, you put a blanket on this thing, though, like a heavy blanket, it can light on fire. <laughs> it's in the manual. Like, please don't put a blanket on this. And it's like, you're putting this in an old folks' home and saying, don't wrap it up? It's a nice product safety issue now. Yeah. <laughs> But it's still a social interaction. Like we, when we design these robots, we have to think how people are going to interact with it. Especially, uh, like it's sad, but people in old folks' homes or when you get older in age might have Alzheimer's or um, memory problems. So even if we try and tell them or uh, things like that, you end up having to have somebody sitting there and watching anyway to make sure this doesn't happen. But seriously, if you have time, read the manual on this. There are comics everywhere in it about like don't put the seal in water because it'll get electrocuted and it's a super happy looking seal that's getting electrocuted. Um, <laughs> it was super fun to read. I chuckled the whole time because of the warning images. Um, but the other fun thing about the seal is that when you pet it and you say a word over and over, it starts to purr when it hears that word. And then it progresses and it gets to the point where you leave the robot like in a different room and it'll still purr when it hears that wor word. So if grandma's talking about global nuclear warfare, information leak. <laughs> if it starts hissing or if it starts purring when somebody else comes in the room and grandma says it. So this is another social thing you wouldn't think about is, you know, how is information getting released from petting a furry seal? And of course we have robot mediators, so robots acting in between people as well. Same thing. If you've got a robot that looks very approachable and people want to give it information, how does that use how does it use the information in a way that wouldn't reveal other things? How does it act towards you? Because we could, these are things that we are already learning to program. Um, Semi-autonomous surgery robots, same thing as teleoperated robots. I meant to take that out. We've also got these robots. They're super cute. They pick people up and take them to other rooms. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but look how happy she is. It's like delivery. <laughs> okay, so question. A lot of the, we see a lot of these robots in a medical environment, and then you also had the one that was in the bank. Do we have laws that now would say that in America, would they be subject to like PCI or HIPAA regulations? I'm Canadian, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, well, they want me to use the microphone. Well, the question is, would, would, uh, would robots have to be subject to PCI and HIPAA regulations, and or basically regulations that would control the use of the personal and uh, the PII so this is something I really want to work with I Am The Cavalry on, because they're doing great things with uh, the medical scene and devices. And like I said before, um, these robots sort of have the same issues, same IoT issues. Like as soon as you hook it up to like internet, mm, stuff happens. Um, but the other fun thing is a lot of these have open USB ports on them. Just like, yeah, you could walk up and I've got a medical robot, woo. Um, so I would like to talk to I Am The Cavalry more about this. Um, they do a lot of great work, but um, yeah, I don't know, but I would love to answer that question for you, so come get my card after. What happens if you pee dog and you Oh, so, okay, I'm gonna go back to this one. <laughs> um, so there's an actually super great paper that came out of U University of Washington. I loved reading this thing, and they actually managed to 
DDoS, like a surgery robot in the middle of surgery by sending, I think it was single packets, like tiny, tiny packets. And it's like the robot didn't know what to do. And it was amazing. And it's like, wow, we could totally, this is easy. Somebody's already done this with something they were already trying to ship out. Um, the other thing too is this, uh, the surgery robot, um, they manage to do other things as well, like reorder commands or delay commands, which is really bad in surgery. <laughs> like, yeah, when you think about trying to tie off somebody's like veins, that's terrifying. How do they get past the ethics board to let them screw up a surgery? Um, How do they get past the ethics board to let them screw up a surgery? That sounds like it would kill someone. So they're fake. They're fake bodies. Like even when you learn, even when you learn surgeries, as far as I know, there's like fake bodies you can get. And you can and you can feel in. Yeah, well, actual dead bodies as well. Um, and yeah, so there's lots of other ways to try it. And I'm I forget what they used in the paper or if I even read that part of it. Eh, abstracts are dumb. Um, so, but that, that's one of the interesting things is there are ways around, uh, or making ethics happy, you just don't use it on a live human usually, uh, or pets or, yeah. Um, sorry? I'm not allowed to talk about that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's about all I have to say. Um, thank you very much. Does anybody else have questions? I would love, love, love more questions. So like anything. So as a hobby roboticist, <laughs> um, I can tell you the network implications are immense here and that the ability to DDoS a robot is generally of the trivial. So the- And what if that happens in the middle of an interaction, like at the bank or something, right? Like- It doesn't matter. I mean, that's yeah. the perfect thing. But the real danger to me is not the DOSing of it. It's the now teleoperating of it in, an, in a way that nobody knows the state has changed. Exactly. I've got root on your box, it's all made of small. <laughs> Good job on the talk. I thought it was very engaging and intriguing. One of, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking about um, this is there's like the misuse of robots um, in order to somehow like victimize or you know, um, you know, exercise a vulnerability on a human. I was thinking also like as far as um, improving processes from a business standpoint, and then there's some ethical implications for that. Say, say for example, like, like the, the person that runs the front desk of a hotel and there's like a preponderance for certain personality types to argue with that person because the person, the human on the other side of the interaction is subjective to things like emotional appeal or, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, you can say, hey, I've been I'm having a rough day, right? Yeah. So, so using, I'm wondering if there's research on the use of robots, like the examples you gave, in order to, to try to combat that argumentative, like emotional appeal that people will have with other humans. And so, so trying to optimize the amount of times that I deviate from a process by using a robot on the other end of that, right? That's actually super researched. Um, that's what other people in my lab have done um, and other papers we've read is that's a huge use. Like we love looking at how robots work together, or robot and people, <coughs> robots and people work together. This one here is called Baxter. Um, it's about yay high, it's pretty big. Um, like Jason Street was under its shoulder when he gave it an awkward hug. Um, but this one works side by side with people. We've used this for quality assurance. Um, so the robot can actually make a, or the person can make a piece and the robot will copy and it will be like, I think this was bad, do it again. And so, and so that's part of it is when somebody can't do something on a factory line properly, they've been using these, um, one of my fellow researchers was doing research into using these robots to be like, nope, do it again, nope, do it again, for things it couldn't do itself. So yeah, we like working side by side. We like keeping people on a path. And um, yeah, production lines are one place we need to keep people on a path. Okay. 
so very related to the last question, um, but you talked a lot about human-robot interaction. Um, are you aware of any research in the field of kind of machine-to-machine -machine communication or robot-to-robot -robot communication and how we might assure trust in, in robot-mediated systems? Um, I only did that a little bit with robot soccer, and it didn't usually end well. It usually ended with like one robot, like people's elbow into the other robot during a soccer match. So um, no, not really. Um, seriously, watch robot soccer videos. It's pretty much just like dog piling constantly. Um, they don't mediate well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on the social engineering research, or social engineering by robots, the authoritativeness and the persuasiveness, did your experiments consider the perceived gender of the robots? Yes, so um, that's one of the problems with um, the white robot that I've been talking about mainly is like, look at those biceps. Like, I'm gonna, I know. Um, like, wait, that one's really good. You can see, like, it's got molded biceps. It doesn't need that. Like, it was, who's it trying to impress? <laughs> Exactly. It, it is very much a male robot. Um, and the, robot. Yes, it is a robot. We joke about that all the time. Because <laughs> it looks like a little football player. It's like this guy is stocky. He's rather, he's dense for his size. Um, but I'm trying to find this other. So this other robot, this one's very gender neutral. And this is one I used in my other lab. And I loved it very much. Because um, I was living with a cousin at the time. And he had a, f a seven year old daughter brought this home and she's like, what's her name? And I'm like, fuck yes. <laughs> um, and we named, we had four of them, Jose, Jennifer, um, fuck, I forget the rest because I only cared about two. Um, <laughs> um, but I brought Jose home a bunch because he has certain programs and we have Jennifer do other things because we changed them a little bit. Um, but I brought Jennifer home that day. I'm like, oh because my cousin's like, no, it's a boy. I'm like, no, this one's a girl. Um, so it does affect things, but unfortunately the labs don't share the resources well, so I did most of my experiments with the male looking one. Um, so it's something I wanna do in the next iteration, which I'm working on right now. Um, but you're right, it does have an effect. I just don't know on this level of persuasion, and I really, really wanna get into that. So thank you for the question, and I will hopefully follow up with you in a year. Any more questions? Is there any research or you know, are the companies being held liable uh, when the vulnerabilities are found? Um, you know, I'm, I just wonder where the responsibility falls. Is it on the user, is it on both? You know, where? That was her thought. So. I'm sorry. Um, it is a very good question though. Like as I was going through these robots, I only found one that publicly posted they had a chief uh, privacy officer. Um, otherwise, there was no real security part to any of these. And I mean, they, uh, you can look, I mean, most of the code is open. Um, the black ones, the Darwins, we can do anything we want to those, no problem. Uh, the Nows are very, very, very controlled. Like, it's really cool. We tried to reset the operating system on it because it come off a of warranty and it's like, time to experiment. Um, and we tried to install a new operating system. And we left it for an hour and had rewritten its operating system with the old one. <laughs> so it was like, oh, OK, we can't do what we want with it. We, like, if there are any vulnerabilities we even fix ourselves, like, there's not really an opportunity to make it better. But yeah, definitely watch the other talk. It was really good. Uh, frustration with robots. I'm a crotchety old man and I could see myself getting very angry because it doesn't hear what I'm saying properly and it, or it's, it's not, you know, here I am having a rough day and it's not giving me the special treatment I want. At what, what happens when people become frustrated with them? Do they like lash out and hit? Do they storm away? Do they I have a great cry? story about this. Okay, great. <laughs> so back to the persuasion one. Um, because it was a script. It was a script. Um, I actually 
it's a little bit lazy, I didn't get the timing, or I didn't have the time to sit there and make sure the robot could respond on time, whatever. So it was teleoperated, but just to the point where it was only pressing buttons. There was no other human interaction or uh, human control of the robot. But, um, so my fellow researcher, that was it, is he was sitting there pressing the buttons, quite literally on the robot, um, and it would actually make people mad. We had one person be like, no, you're a robot. Don't you dare like talk back to me. And they got really ragey. Um, and back to ethics boards, like I, my fellow researcher was like, I actually feel really uncomfortable. I've never done that to somebody before. I've never made them this angry. Um, and so there's something we want to research more, but yeah, like we need to have these sort of protocols in. We have to think about how we're affecting people. Like when people get so angry, that's when you have really bad like s social events happen is when one group gets angry enough. I hope it's not the rising of the seniors. That might be extra terrifying. <laughs> 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 Um, but yeah, like aggravation is a real part of dealing with robots. It is, um, so social robotics isn't a super old field, obviously, because, well, computers first, you, you work your way up. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something somebody needs to research into, so I'll try and see what I can do. So here's an additional thought. <laughs> I inherently social engineer things. Robots, AI, auto callers, political pollsters, it's fun. I have so many papers for you. <laughs> Do you run into that? Or have you considered that aspect? So um, I just actually uh, graduated the undergrad part. So I, it's all been in labs. Um, and like I said, the ethics boards, it's very hard to get anything outside um, to try and, like ethics boards are so hard. Um, but one of the parts about it is it has to be in a controlled space. I can't let just anybody walk by. And if I tell you to social engineer it, like most of what we do is um, suspense of belief, right? Like it's just the fact that you believe it's doing what it's supposed to be doing that makes it work. The same way we think magicians, right? Like you assume like, oh my God, that guy's magic. Of course, that's amazing. Like I went to watch a show last night and it's like, yeah, I had my magic friend with me. He's like, oh, watch that thing, watch this thing. I'm like, oh, that, I can totally see what's happening. It's still a great show because I'm like, I get to learn things. But it's a sp suspense of belief or disbelief that makes things like that work. And that's the same way we do with robots. Um, actually, when we have a, uh, a second researcher controlling the robot, we call it Wizard of Ozzing. I think it'll be equal. I think it'll be equal. Because we treat robots the same way. Like, it, it's... The comparison point I'm thinking of is, is the auto call. Somebody calls me up, political pollster, and you know wants me to go do a survey. If it's a real person, I manipulate them differently than if it's a robocaller and it goes through a thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, the great part about these types of robots are, though, is that they have a body. Um, and the fact that they are doing uh, gestures, um, meeting your eyes, they, they get the full social training, but the best part is, is they don't have bad days. <laughs> they don't, they're not going to forget their training. Um, like as soon as I showed some of my friends, friends this that work in other companies, like we could replace that girl that can't get her stuff done every day because they could have this robot that won't be sick, it won't take extra days off, or the guy that like won't finish his filing every day because they just do what they're supposed to do, and they act how they're supposed to act. That's why we name them. That's why like people will ha like do events with these robots. That's why they work in customer service is because we treat them like people, and this is why this whole talk is here. So um, that's why I think it's going to be equal because there's a body, uh, and I can give you a video on this as well, where we, uh, one of my researchers that was part of the um, empathy thing was his full. Uh, experiment was on whether we empathize more with on-screen robots or in-person robots, and in-person robots was way more effective. So I th think it'll be about equal, the people and human and robots. Yeah. Uh, another question. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, being that this is like, you know, somewhat of a hacker conference, you know, um, 
going down the route of using a robot to pivot and maybe get information that you couldn't get in person, I'm imagining like I'd be less likely to tell someone random, a person, like my private Wi-Fi password at my house, but if a robot that was on my network came up to me and asked me, I'd be more likely to. I'd, I'd think less about that decision. It'd be like, okay, well, the robot probably needs it. So in that vein or like in, in that topic, I wonder if there's research that could be done related to what type of tasks are people more likely to be manipulated by a robot than a human. Social engineering, engineering tasks, there's like clicking links and a variety of things that happen inside of a social engineering um, space that it's interesting to see. Well, which, which, which types of those tasks are easier for a robot to accomplish than a human when they're doing social engineering? The first thing that popped up in, into my mind is those uh, annoying credit card people at airports. <laughs> I, I could see more people going to a, a robot than somebody who's like, hi, hi, can I get you, get you to stop besides this adorable robot being like, hi, can I give you a credit card? I'd probably talk to the robot. I don't talk to the people. Um, so I could see that being more effective, persuading you to get more airport MasterCards or, or visas. I guess I should be saying credit cards. Wow, product placement. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's part of it. Like That's a really good uh, question is what tasks would they be better at? And I think it's things we already discount people for. Like, you, like who answers the phone surveys anyway? <laughs> Like, yeah, exactly. But but it's something where as soon as somebody picks up, you're like, oh fuck, and you hang up. Well, robocalls didn't work there. But again, these annoying salespeople, like in the middle of the mall, trying to give you perfume. It's a cute robot. It's different. I might start speaking to it. Whereas the people you already know, oh, this is something I can ignore and walk away. But when it's the same every time, screw the robot. I'm walking. So that's the thing though, it's uh, levels of adoption. So it's where you start. And right now we're at the forefront of this. So it's so something we can know do. now. Yeah. yeah. So that was sort of the purpose. Yeah. Um, I guess I wonder if there have been any studies from any of the organizations that have um, like, like when I call my bank and they have an automated tel you know, system, if they're actually monitoring any of my verbiage when I'm getting frustrated to recognize like we're just going to send her straight to the representative she's getting really pissed off because apparently what she's saying isn't being recognized and we're going to we're going to recognize that I wonder if they've done any studies that you could resource for the empathy you know uh, pull like something where you could recognize um, okay they've already they've already noticed certain um, vocal recognition or um, certain things that people say or do that might cause a heightened sense of frustration that you could resource to try and make sure that the robots react accordingly. So the fun part about all my research is I haven't had to touch AI at all. <laughs> um, most of what we do, we want to look at how having a body changes things and how um, the like gesturing and gaze is like almost overdone already because people keep like eye gaze is so important. Like if I was looking over here and responding to you, like you would feel unappreciated. So that's what we test with the robots, is if we have that same effect on people. Um, AI is a whole different lab that I tried for a little while and didn't want to stay. Um, but that's sort of the thing with social robotics is a lot of it is just Wizard of Oz it, because we have other people working on that. Just like I don't do any computer vision with these because we have other people to do that. Um, but I would probably source other people to do that for me and figure that out. But um, when it comes to social implications of that, I'm much more interested. So I'd probably just fake something together. <laughs> um, question? Yeah, a quick question. So fellow Canadian, represent, woo. Um, uh, so I'm a big fan of video games. And one of the things they've been exploring in video games with robotics, um, particularly the Geth in Mass Effect and the Omnics in uh, Blizzard's Overwatch, is they've, they've been exploring these worlds where, where robots have become completely self-aware and now they're fighting for their own rights to survive and be part of the rest of the world and be treated equally. Uh, in your opinion, do, do you see that as an actual feasible future that we could one day find ourselves in? And if so, what, what type of barriers would have to be overcome to get there? I actually heard a great title this week. What was it? It was um, Robot Anthropologist or something. Like somebody's actually already got this job title that they're studying like the culture of robots, like the culture that robots have on their own. It's like, what? That is so cool. Like, I want this job, but that's what they're already trying to do is, is um, have you watched Futurama? And you know how they always have like robo kind rallies and Bender's always like kill all humans except one. Um, 
One great thing about robots is they're very easy to figure out what social interactions we need because we already have pop culture. Like we already respond, they expect robots to be able to do what they can read in books, what they can see on TV, what they can see in movies. So anytime I bring participants in, they're like, it's like in the movies. Like, or it's like that book I read. And they get really excited because they already know how to interact with it. So um, when you're talking about, yes, do I think this is going to be a thing? Do I think RoboKind is going to be a thing? I think is the gist of your question. I think yes, because we already see it in pop culture, so we're going to want it to be. But that's like holy fucking ways out. All right, we've got time for one more. I know uh, when a robot is assembled, uh, it, the more it looks like a human, the closer it approaches the uncanny valley. Is there also a verbal uncanny valley? Uh, if it's scripted responses, I know, okay, I'm dealing with a robot. But if it's a very interactive response, I can tell, I, I can tell the difference between human and robot conversation. But is there a point at which the robot conversation is just too close but not quite, and it's like, whoa, crap, get me out of here. So this is a very Canadian moment. Um, the robot, trying to get it to say face A or face B, but it would say face A instead of face A if I typed it as face A. So the only way to get this to work was to do face space Canadian A. <laughs> yeah. So it was close enough, but we did have to do some fudging to make it not reach verbal uncanny valley. So that's a very valid question, and it does happen. Like, well, I mean, also like just the sophistication of the communication. You know, I think you should choose B. Well, I want it. Well, really, I think you're being irrational. You should choose B. What the hell? You know? <laughs> um, we strayed away from that because we get too much human element in, and we'd get too much of you know. If I was sitting there typing it in, then it's way too much of my opinion, and it's not testing what we're wanting to test. Um, but I'm sure. Hobbyist, maybe you want to play with that part. So that's great. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Give me questions. Thank you, Brittany.